old-fashioned methods, giving way to modern and scientific processing like pasteurizing, homogenizing, procuring milk once troublesome, time-consuming, and unsanitary. Now, fast, efficient delivery service. Milk to you in sanitary containers sealed within a few hours from the time it left the cows. Milk untouched by human hands. What's new and different is industrial agriculture where milk is, uh, has bovine growth hormones and antibiotics and the dairy animals are grain fed. That's what's different. What's been happening for millennia is a relationship between humans and dairy animals that includes drinking their milk. That's what I would say to people who say raw milk is dangerous. History says otherwise. Raw milk is dangerous. So is peanut butter and salad mix and spinach and Cargill's ground turkey. That's really dangerous. It killed somebody, sickened 70 people. Cargill's not being prosecuted. Cargill's not being closed down. Um, Cargill voluntarily withdrew 36 million pounds of ground turkey because it was dangerous. CDFA has people who've been on the milk boards and, and in, in the dairy pocket side. So I don't think it's about health. They try to couch everything in public health. This has nothing to do with public health. Why is it illegal for private individuals to perform private services for people who have contracted with us to board their goats and receive the milk? And that's a very puzzling situation. I was born in London, England, and she was born in Beijing, China. But we both grew up and became professionals in the microprocessor business. She had learned how to program and was a software expert. So when we met, we uh, immediately became friends and that turned into a strong relationship pretty quickly. So we bought this house and as everybody knows, the industry in 2000 and beyond has become very difficult. Like a lot of couples, we've had income that was invested in property and the property equity was really our retirement guarantee but all that equity has disappeared so now we're left with having to be resourceful at the age of 67 I don't have an opportunity for um, another career so we looked at what we had and we made the best of what we had by turning the house back into what it used to be and that's a farm a dairy farm there used to be cows here it was run by three sisters and uh, a brother who were some of the first settlers in Evergreen in 1915. So we looked around at what we could do in terms of legally producing milk as a form of living. What we discovered was that if we boarded people's goats, it's legal to do uh, what's called an Agistor agreement, which is an old agreement whereby people can have goats that they would board with us. We would milk the goats for them and they would come and collect the milk as part of um, their own property. So that's what we did. that there are small farms that can provide people with local, humanely raised, sustainably produced, raw, alive products, because I just think it's healthier. In our location where we live, we're really not able to have a goat in our, our property, so this uh, was our next best alternative to actually you know, own a goat or own a share of the goat and then be able to partake of the dairy. Beautiful farm in San Jose. This wonderful couple just taking care of the goat, loving all of the animals they have here. And they explain to us about herd share, what that is, how we are actually owners. Do you like the farm? Yeah. What do you like most about it? The goats. Why do you like them? Because they chew your hair. They chew your hair. Basically what we do is uh, 
breeding the Guernsey goat and uh, have activity for the kids come petting the farm and come here to some activity, birthday party and petting the animals. This is the most things we, we like to do. We don't like to really want some commercial, do some commercial dairy. We live in San Francisco, so we have a very small backyard. Yeah, I don't think there's any goats in Valley. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're lucky to have a little patch of strawberries where, where we live. That's about all we get. It's a blessing to be able to have this goat down here. I was diagnosed last year with breast cancer, and I mean, there is no other milk I would drink because most cattle are fed with GMO crops, and that's certainly nothing I'm going to be putting in my body. But I feel, you know, just 100% comfortable putting raw dairy into my body. Triple goodness. Fresh, pure, and energizing. The most perfectly balanced food there is. Wholesome, nutritious, and tasty. One quart of milk contains the protein value of one serving of beefsteak or four eggs. In addition, carbohydrates for quick energy equal to three slices of bread or two servings of potatoes. Plus the calcium value of four pounds of spinach or four pounds of string beans. All this in one quart of milk. From a nutritional standpoint, having been in medicine for 34 years, I understand that goat's milk is very close to human's milk in terms of its fat quantity. And the benefits of it are that it's easily assimilated and uh, easily digested by humans. That leads me into the, my own birth story. I had a, a uh, in the late 40s, a high forceps uh, delivery and um, uh, didn't get breastfed, which was also discouraged in those days. And then I was immediately given uh, cow's milk-based formula, uh, which I didn't tolerate. And the combination of the high forceps delivery, which uh, can traumatize the autonomic system quite a bit for the first year of life, um, combined with the lack of mother's milk, set off my gut so that I couldn't hold anything in. And the story goes that I was constantly agitated and couldn't sleep and couldn't digest. And finally this old physician told my mom to go to uh, uh, a goat farm in Berkeley. So she did and she brought home some raw organic goat's milk and that kept me alive the first year of life. I'm here because of that. The combination of the colostrum and the rich nutrients in, in unpasteurized raw goat's milk um, nursed my immune system and got me off and running in life. While the cows are munching on their concentrated foods, electrical milking machines do their job quickly, efficiently, and sanitarily. Old Bossy has certainly done her part, but now modern dairy processing brings to perfection her almost perfect food. If you really have a stomach problem with pasteurized milk or cannot digest cow milk, period, because you're maybe intolerant to uh, lactose or um, other parts of the milk, then goat milk is quite often an only option that people can go to. So the goat milk customers that we see have a need that is typically to do with some digestive issues. Quite often it's the children that get intolerant to cow milk and they, they need to get access to goat milk on a regular basis. So we provide those people with the ownership agreements. If they understand that there are issues to do with safety and they understand how to uh, recognize clean milk and dirty milk and milk that may have something in it, then that education is enough to keep everybody safe. We're very clean in what we do as an operation. We're meticulous in terms of how we milk the goats. Their livelihood, their business is dependent upon their cleanliness. So that is, you know, iodine, you know, sterilization of their hands and the, of the udders and make, make, making sure all the jars and um, equipment they use is, is sterile. If one person got sick, I mean, everyone would be sick and that would be the end of their business. I think, you know, the herd share agreement that we have here 
is just a beautiful thing and there's no need for uh, governmental you know, inspections and controls. And the model of this, of getting together, sharing this resource where I actually buy a goat, but Mike and Jane tend it for me, love it, care for it, and harvest its product for me, and that we have this direct relationship. I mean, they are clean and so well knowledge on producing milk. Um, my government should never get between that. We've had a successful two years of growth and we're really surprised this year when uh, we received some certified letters from the district attorney's office in San Jose asking that we cease and desist in what they called the criminal activity of milking a goat and giving the goat milk to the owners. Um, not only was this a surprise, it was obviously a shock uh, what this meant to us in terms of retired people um, following their dream to sustain themselves for the rest of their lives through goat farming was that we suddenly had to rethink that opportunity. This is not the best use of the federal government's time. Uh, I can imagine there's a lot more issues that, for them to deal with and I know they're big fans of big farms, um, but here we are having a great community service where we're having terrific benefit and I, I can't imagine this is the best use of their time. You can go down the street and buy cigarettes and alcohol, which are definitely something that can can harm your your health. And but you can they're gonna someone's gonna take the time and effort to you know try to eliminate this resource in our community. It's important for me to have Evergreen Acres here offering the products that they do because there are many people who need the benefits of raw milk products. I believe that pasteurized milk is sterile, dead milk, and that there's nothing alive about it. I grew up having raw milk, and I know that it's very good for you, and I want to provide the same thing for my kids. So I'm a big uh, believer in, in independent grassroots effort like this, healthy lifestyle, and animals that are treated with respect. I believe people should uh, be able to make a choice what food they want to put in their mouth. There is a point where you start regulating raw this and raw that. And What are you going to do, regulate mother's milk next? Are you going to demand that mothers homogenize their, pasteurize their milk before giving it to their child? It's really reached an, an absurd point, in my opinion. If people want to have collectives where they have access to their own goat's uh, raw milk, they should be allowed to do so. The last thing we need is somebody telling us what to eat or how we should get our food. That is basically fundamentally wrong. And we sort of saw this as a place that would try out sustainability, try out all these buzzwords that, that we use and see how they work. 
but that also would be kind of a, a resource, a training place for young people and bring their own ideas. And we've had a lot of that with people like Amanda, you know, bringing new ideas and new talents to the farm and trying out things, learning things. We, we had a fellow last summer who wanted to learn to make cheese and then he wanted to learn to make bread. And, you know, we could help with that. One role that we could play is to try to stimulate that kind of learning and make it available to people because we really think people are going to need it. The, the large agribusiness farm is not going to last as oil runs out. It's just not. It's going to fall apart. Yes, sir. Watch out. Watch out. I'm an aspiring young farmer, I suppose, and this is definitely the place to, to get your hands dirty in all aspects of farming. You learn about gardens, you learn about your food. So my connection is just to help support Family Farm. That's very dear to my heart, and I support what's happening here, um, which is, I, I guess, love and family and sustainability and having a relationship with what sustains you, with your food and sharing that with other people. My grandmother grew up in, in a world where women didn't have the same rights and, and weren't expected to do much of anything aside from the housewife, you know, and she, but she rose up and she was defiant and she was courageous and um, she was called to be what, you know, that generation called for, which, you know, she's a mechanical engineer and, and a brilliant, brilliant one. Um, and that is her pride and joy. My pride and joy is being, is rising up and being courageous um, by doing what I'm doing, which is farming and supporting the land and supporting where our food comes from. chickens, I like the goats, and I like the vegetables. What do you like about the farm? Uh, the redwood tree. That's what I like about the farm. Do you um, like goat's milk? Yeah. I like dragons the best too. And the I like space better than anything. Um, we don't have a cow anymore. They took the cows away. Who took the cows away? I don't know. We yeah. had them so long ago. I don't even remember. I was a political scientist for 20 years before we came here. I've always wanted to be a farmer ever since I was a little kid and we're talking about 55 years ago, I was just fascinated with what were even then crumbling farms on the edges of St. Louis where I grew up. But what really crystallized it was our Aunt Anna's milk. It was fresh cow's milk. Um, she gave it to us every morning on oatmeal and it was the most wonderful milk we had ever tasted. And that really made an impression. Um, I'm not quite sure why, except that the milk was so wonderful. So I've always gardened, and when I got dissatisfied with academic life, I began to think more about what I really wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and by then, my older daughters, a couple of them were interested in farming, and I um, followed along and visited them and um, thought about it and decided that's really what I wanted to do. I, I, I really wanted to be back on the land. So that's, that's how we came here.
regulatory system is broken. It does not adequately protect Americans from serious widespread foodborne illnesses. Our meals have grown more complex, more varied ingredients, diverse methods of preparation and shipping. By the time raw agricultural products find their way to our dinner plates, multiple intermediate steps and processes have taken place. Food ingredients travel thousands of miles, or as Senator Urban just said, from other countries. Here to factories, to our table, they're intermingled, they're mixed along the way. And yet, despite all these changes, our food safety laws have not changed in 70 years. We need to give FDA the resources and the authority that it needs to cope with the growing and varied risk that threatens today's more abundant and diverse food supply. Here today, we're going to be taking our goats downtown to milk them to send a message to our elected officials that um, the people of Santa Cruz don't approve of legal actions being taken against family farms who are operating herd share dairies. Um, we're just being proactive and uh, sending a message out to people and raising awareness about what's happened in the rest of California. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to make a difference on the state level. I didn't really grow up drinking milk, so it's kind of a new thing for me to start um, getting into dairy and actually being able to drink it. But I really just feel like people should have the option, you know, that we have this kind of black box industrial food system where extracted resources come in and potato chips and soda and whatever comes out. And if you want to, you know, eat from that system, that's fine. But if you want to have a relationship with your food and be able to have access to the foods you want to be able to eat, you should have that right too. And so that's really what... Um, is what keeps me going is that I don't want to eat potato chips and soda every day. I want to be able to have fresh food and know my farmers and know my neighbors. The recent attacks, I have my personal theories on what has started it. I mean, we live in a big dairy state. We live in the biggest dairy state and the herd share numbers are growing and I feel like they're, um, the big dairy is feeling pressure to you know, put a stop to that and also that the CDFA hasn't really been protecting people's safety with the outbreak of um, resistant salmonella with the cargill ground turkey that they have to kind of be more active now and say we are protecting your health you know we are doing something and raw milk is an easy target because a lot of people you know can get scared by it that it's dangerous so we're just trying to pretty much defend family farms now <laughs>
since I've been in the city. <laughs> but um, they're here and they're going to share their milk with you. Just want to tell you a little bit of why we're down here. We think that we do have the rights to grow our own food and eat it too. <laughs> we've written for the county. It's pretty radical. It's the right to grow food. We have a couple of copies floating around. We've got people with clipboards. If you want to sign it to let all of our Board of Supervisors know that you support our right to grow food. We also have a couple of letters that we want to send to our DAs and our Sheriff to let them know that we don't approve of violence being used against family farms. There have been SWAT raided um, farm raids in California and we don't think it's very nice to treat the people who grow our food that way. So, sign a postcard and we'll send it to the sheriff and the DA to let them know that we don't want to use um, our resources to attack family farms. So, um, I'm going to milk our goats and if you want to drink some, you can because you have the right to make the options about what you want to put in your body. This is perfectly healthy. It's good for you, it's good for us, and it's good for our economy. This is keeping keeping jobs local, keeping people healthy. It's not sending money to some big corporation that's running a factory farm. So I think this is really important. This is awesome. More power to all of these farmers and the goats, and it's beautiful. I'm glad to be here to support it. I highly advocate raw milk. My whole family drinks it, so I'm very happy about that. And I think it's ridiculous that our government is trying to take away real foods and tell us what we can or cannot drink. They let us buy preservative-filled foods in the store, and processed foods, and genetically modified foods, but we can't have this really nutritious, wholesome, life-saving raw milk. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> there is no way that when you know the exact source of your food that you have the danger that you have from a lot of the super corporate overprocessed and just simply oversized availabilities of even raw other raw fruits and vegetables the fact that it comes from too many places and all gets commingled versus knowing a local place where you get your food there is no comparison the first time I tasted raw milk I was hooked I loved it and raw goat's milk is the only milk that I uh, besides my breast milk that Willa yeah. drinks. Yeah, straight from the udder too is phenomenally warm and delicious. Yeah. Yummy. I couldn't uh, make milk for Henry and um, so I went and got dairy goats and um, that's what Owen drinks. one of the sisters from my sister's farm. I'm a retired firefighter and always wanted to be a farmer when I was younger. I was in FFA in high school and had a lag experience that way, but I never um, grew up in a farm situation in that sense. So I just had my high school time with a dream of being a farmer. And then around 10 years ago, we found some, a piece of ground here and we built this farm 
and primarily it was a, really a hobby farm in the end. And when my sisters and I retired, Val was a retired sheriff's deputy now, and my sister Janet is retired Air Force flight nurse, lieutenant colonel. We all um, were going to move to Costa Rica and enjoy our retirement, sell the hobby farm I'd done that time and had fun. And then it, my granddaughter got born, and the reality hit is who was going to feed her? Where was she going to get real food? Because our industrialized food system has been an abysmal failure, an 80-year experiment showing that it hasn't worked very well. You can tell by the health of the country in general the failure that it was. So I realized we have 10 acres, we have some animals, and it's time to become serious farmers. So I set up a herd share program. I joined the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, and they um, helped me do the contracts and stuff to get this together. So it was moving along very nicely. We have 15 members who share in this milk. Four of them actually milk the cows themselves periodically, some very regularly. And about March of this year, I got a letter from the CDFA, it's a cease and desist letter, saying we had to do six, meet six different um, items. And when we looked at it, I agreed we would do four of them, no problem. I would, no problem testing the cows for tuberculosis, testing for brucellosis, having them come test our milk for pathogens and that it was clean. I had no problems with that. I already knew I met the chilling requirements um, because of what I do. And I said, I will do these four things without a problem. I said, I have a problem in that I will not become a licensed dairy because I'm not, and I already knew what it took to become one. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars in investments, things like you had to have nine foot ceiling in a milk room, and the, no, no other animals on the farm area, and none of this would work. I'm a farm, not a dairy. Pasteurization was a great step forward in the purifying of milk, and today almost all milk goes through this process. The foremost dairy uses the flash method. This method of pasteurization destroys any harmful bacteria in 15 seconds at 160 degrees. As a chemical engineer, had seen a lot of those factories understand what high temperature, high pressure would do to the ingredients in any product, including dairy product. So we have chosen to eat the dairy product naturally, just like the way I nurse my child. I would not you know, have my own milk um, boiled before I give it to my child. I just have chosen to give my child the product naturally. I don't need a bulk tank. I go straight from the goat into a temporary tank, into a bottle. The larger farms have to deal with many cows. They take the raw milk from many farms and they commingle it. It's something called a milk pool, and that's for productivity reasons. So many farms produce raw milk, and the raw milk that goes into the milk pool is called market milk. Market milk is not worth very much because you would get sick if you drank it. It is only tested to 750 coliforms per mil. That's 75 times dirtier than you're allowed to do it in the raw milk industry. And it's the same as the test limit on pasteurized milk. The smaller the system, the cleaner the milk. My milk is probably 10 times cleaner than anything else, certainly when it's hand cleaned, than is produced in your local store. We've got test results that prove that. You could be endangering your health if you drink raw milk. How do we know? because hundreds of people have gotten sick from drinking raw milk over the past decade. Getting sick from raw milk can mean many days of diarrhea, stomach cramping, and vomiting. Sometimes it can also lead to kidney and liver disease, paralysis, chronic disorders, and even death. Raw milk can be especially dangerous for infants and young children, the elderly, and people with weakened immune systems. Patty loves that fresh, warm milk. And then, too, it's fun doing things with Barb. Mmm, uh-oh. A little mustache there, young lady. Come on, let's wipe it off. <laughs> that looks better. JJ, do you want to say thank you to the camera for all the delicious milk that you get? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Some of my research, it, it was quite common back at the turn of the last century for doctors yeah. to prescribe raw milk as a health cure and 
um, you know, without question had, had many good results with the chronic health conditions of their patients, all of which stopped after milk was pasteurized. Yes, people should know that um, there are risks, but there are risks with, with any food. And the, the, the best way to handle those risks is to know your farmer, is to be able to come out and meet the goats and see what the procedures are and, um, and just assure yourself that this is being done in a safe and sanitary way. Can't do that with pasteurized milk. Pasteurization does not kill off 100% of bad bacteria inside the milk. It's just a fact. That's why we got UHT milk, because some of it was surviving, and that's still true. The fact that we allow dirty milk to go into a pasteurization plant is criminal in terms of we know that there's some of that that's going to get out the back end of that activity. No one has ever gotten sick from our milk. Our kids, our grandkids drink it, in addition to our shareholders who drank it and never got sick. And I was being told to cease and desist, yet, you know, Hormel Foods, whose turkey burger had actually, you know, sickened people, wasn't being told to cease and desist. The whole language made me angry. I felt like we were being treated like some sort of criminal. Talk about it now, I just feel a lot of anger about it. My sisters and I, we all took the oath of office when we took our jobs. They were all public servant jobs. We took the oath of office. When we retired, we didn't rescind that oath. And all of a sudden, that oath to protect the Constitution has hit home in a really strong way. And so all three of us are completely behind this. The Constitution was written to protect our freedoms. And what more basic right is there than the right to choose what you feed yourself and from whom you buy it? When they told me to cease and desist, I could have. But there's 15 members of this cow share who wouldn't be able to get this milk, which is very, very special. It's incredible milk. Do you put your faith in the CDFA and the FDA and the USDA that they're going to keep you safe? Or do you maybe put your faith in the farmer that you actually know? You can come and visit. You can see. You can help. So there needs to be a new paradigm, a completely new paradigm for healthy food now. And the old way is kicking and screaming to not die, and they're trying to squish the new way. We're kind of stepping forward into the past in many ways. <laughs>I started getting fresh goat's milk from my own goat. Um, it helps bring me back to the roots of where our food really comes from and shows me the importance of taking care of animals uh, to provide for us and how important it is for us to care for these animals. So this is something that I really cherish and I love my animal. The 10 acre parcel can be a threat. Big business and the big commodities work on like a 3% profit margin. That's it. So if enough people, and it doesn't take very much to affect 3%, actually go out and do this, those things can fall. And so you can vote with your fork, you can vote with your where you put your food dollars, and you can vote by calling your people and telling them. Tell, tell the legislators, tell the senators. They listen, I went down and talked, they had no idea this was going on. And now it's like, wake up 
and they're seeing it. And uh, the sheriff, too, when we brought it to them, the pressure, and we said, where do you stand here? If the FDA wants to come raid our farm, he didn't know that the farmers were being basically oppressed. And uh, if 88% of the dairies of 200 acres or less have folded in the last 10 years, what we have left, on one hand, are the large conglomerate corporate factory farm dairies, and on the other hand, little folks like us, family farms of 10, 5 acres. Um, the middle has fallen out, just like the middle is, fall is falling out of the middle class. You know, the middle is falling out of farming. And we have the behemoths on one hand, and we have the little folks like us on the other. And, uh, and so we have a huge weight to carry uh, if we're going to have a road into the future. And that's, uh, that's the importance of family farms. I think the small farm is going to be the savior of our country in many ways. We're struggling to pay the mortgage, uh, which is uh, more than two-thirds of what we get in terms of income on a monthly basis from uh, the boarding operation. If we have to move, the house is probably underwater by a substantial amount at this point, so we don't have any equity that we can put into another property, and we certainly would not be uh, approved in terms of taking a loan on a new property. So it means renting or leasing a farm somewhere else uh, and starting from scratch. People can't let small farmers and small dairy shares and go down because if they do, you know, what's next? You're, you are giving up your rights and then if it gets that far, you know, there's no stopping. It's going to happen. Call off the dogs on the little farmers. It's, it's, they've really come down hard.